You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Kyle McCarthy on the show with me today. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called Everyone Knows How Much I Love You, and this is a fantastic addition to your summer uh, thriller psychological reads. Uh, This is a must-have for your bookshelf. Welcome to the show, Kyle. Thank you so much for having me, Hank. I'm excited to have you. Um, Kyle, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? That's a great question. It's funny. I have so many strong memories of loving to read uh, and the intoxication and escape that reading gave me. But I think my earliest memory of really wanting to be a writer is getting very angry at my mother and going for this long bike ride and experiencing how cathartic it was to work hard in my body to sort of alchemize that anger and then wanting to put that experience into words, which is um, sort of a strange thing for a 10 year old to want to do. But I wrote the story up for my fourth grade class, and I vividly remember someone in the class saying, that is the most boring story I've ever heard. (laughs) (laughs) And maybe that was when I knew that I was meant to be a writer. (laughs) That's amazing. Um, Alchemize the anger is probably the best description of of working through an emotion in a in a storyteller's way that, that I've probably ever heard. Um, you know, taking this one thing, creating something completely different out of it. Um, you know, writing can be very cathartic, uh, as you illustrated. Um, is it something that you think about very often when you're working now? Is that you know, kind of the, uh, the alchemy, uh, of storytelling or, uh, is it something that you anchor back to? I think it is, although, there's a funny tension that runs through writing because on the one hand, I think many of us write in order to understand or perhaps even master experiences that are painful or troubling. But on the other hand, once an experience has been completely explained, it becomes a little airless. And so it's not quite the same as therapy where you sort of get some kind of crystal understanding of something and then it's no longer mysterious. So I think when I'm writing, I'm often I'm seeking that kind of alchemy, but I'm also mindful of the fact that to explain something fully to myself would probably be to drain it of its mystery. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, uh, uh, the paralysis by analysis, maybe uh, yeah. some things just need to kind of live and wonder a little bit, don't they? I think that's right. Yeah. So uh, as a as a big reader, uh, as a kid, do you remember the first book or, or story uh, series or author that you read that just completely transformed you and took you to another place? And do you remember what uh, it was that can kind of conveyed the power of story that that it holds over us? I think my answer might be Nancy Drew, <laughs> which is funny. Um, in terms, in terms of like a, a kind of early reading experience that completely transformed or transfixed me. And I mean, I think as many children, I was sort of hypnotized by the repetitious nature of a series. There was something intoxicating about being put into a familiar world with a familiar rhythm, and yet there was also kind of mystery and intrigue going on. 
I think Nancy Drew has been a gateway drug for so many writers. Um, you have no idea how many people have sat on the other side of the microphone from me and, mm -hmm. and, and said that Nancy Drew was one of their earliest influences. Uh, and, and I know that was a kind of a, a stock of writers who, who, who wrote that series, but um, if, if they knew the impact that they had on, on this generation of writers, I think they'd probably be stunned. I think that's probably right. And it's Nancy Drew is also a sort of young girl who gets out and does things and figures things out. And her destiny is not wrapped up in marriage or romance. And I think even at seven or eight, there was something interesting about that to me. Um, it made the world feel wide. So I think that that is also probably part of her legacy. Right. When did you know, Kyle, that you were going to be a writer? Um, I, I think a lot of kids have uh, imagination and illusions to, uh, you know, one day I'll do this, uh, you know, but there's something about people that decide they're going to be writers that their their life takes a certain path. Uh, and, and a lot of times that path is sidetracked by, you know, little things like paying bills and you know having to take care of families and things like that. But, you know, it eventually winds back around to, to writing and, and the stories have to come out. Um, what was your first memory or your first experience with knowing that you were going to tell stories? Hmm. Um, it's funny. I mean, I think as a as a teenager, I got more interested in storytelling and I actually wrote plays for a little bit. But. Again, I think I think I've always, even as a child, was interested in the way that uh, people told stories. I was always very interested in the way that adults would talk about their day or relay a conversation. So I can remember listening to that and sort of trying to imitate that. And maybe that attention to voices kind of translated into writing plays as a teenager. And then there was a moment in college when I was like, oh, theater is hard. You have to collaborate with people. <laughs> <laughs> you you don't have control. Um, and there was something sort of more appealing about the written word and the page where it was just me and I could sort of arrange things just so. So I don't know if that's, that's sort of a grand answer, like a, a bunch of years in the sweep, but I think there was something about being interested in voices and storytelling and then eventually being sort of drawn into the control that you have when it's just you and the page. I, I think there are definitely a lot of frustrated uh, theater kids that, that go into writing um, because like you said, you have the ultimate control. Um, you control the actors, you control the, the uh, you know, the, the script writing you control all you're, you're the director and, and you get to have sole control over that. And in, instead of the collaborative issue, and then, you know, we learn that, that writing, is a bit of a collaboration when we start dealing with editors and publishers and, and all of that, there's a certain amount of collaboration that goes with that. But, but there's something about that feeling of being totally in control of this world. Isn't there? I think so. I think so. And again, I think it's what connects writing back to reading because reading is also a very private experience. It's just you in the book and however you imagine the world or whatever you think of the characters, that's just you. It just belongs to you. Um, even as other people may read the same book and have similar different opinions and you can talk about it. So there's this way in which books become social, but the sort of primal moment of reading is something that's very solitary and private, just as that's the case for writing. One of the reasons that I started this podcast was uh, because I wanted to connect with writers and, and understand the creative process uh, as it as it exists in, in each one of their lives and to kind of understand what makes creative people tick. Um, I, I know that you have a fascination with that as well, because looking at your website, you've you published a number of essays um, about writers and, and their process and, you know, how how they exist in the world, what makes them special, what what maybe makes them a little off uh, from David Foster Wallace to mm -hmm. Alison 
uh, Alice Munro, Hillary Man- Mantel. Uh, there's a number of those. Um, what is it uh, that that helps you to connect to other creative people, and and why do you like to study them? No, oh, that's a great question. I think I think part of the reason I write is to be in conversation with other writers, and so deeply engaging with their work, reading a series of essays or their stories and novels and trying to think about what they mean to me and articulate something about them is a way for me to indirectly feed back into my own work. I also think it's just uh, fascinating to think about the arc of people's lives, particularly women's lives and the way that Fiction writing, which takes an enormous amount of solitude, uh, can exist alongside or with uh, raising children and, as you say, paying bills and doing the work of being in the world. So I think we're all trying to figure out how to be creative people. And it's always interesting to get, try to get close to another life and mind that's navigated those waters. And- You've you published uh, quite a bit of short fiction uh, as well as your new novel. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference in writing short fiction and then writing uh, longer form fiction like a novel? Uh, what does writing short fiction afford the writer that writing a novel can't? Oh, that's a great question. I I think to write. I think to write a good short story is relatively easier possible, but to write a great one is almost impossible and takes a lot of luck. So I I see them as sort of uh, two separate spheres. And I think a good short story or a great short story, there's like a fair amount of luck and you're unconscious working together. So I get, hmm. So I guess it's sort of maybe a chance to offer yourself up to the gods of creativity a little bit more. There's a little bit less, uh, I don't even want to say there's less grunt work because I think I've spent as much time on a short story as I have on <laughs> a novel. Sure. Um, but there's kind of that magical element. There's like something maybe a little bit closer to a poet's sensibility that inflects the best fiction. Um, and it's fun to try to get close to that, even though it's also so hard. Right. Noveler is the best way to write a novel. Why? Quite simply because we've made it the easiest place to do it. Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need, Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily, It's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox. It allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches like allowing you to write both offline and online, unique for a web-based platform. Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's Couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year. And it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. Um, I always go back to the advice uh, of Ray Bradbury, who was uh, a brilliant short story writer and 
who wrote tons of short fiction as, as well as novels. Um, but his advice to young writers was to write short fiction, write a new story every week, because at the end of the year, can you really write 52 bad short stories? <laughs> you know, that, that kind of the, you know, the, the idea that, that the, the rote um, exercise of going through something, you know, eventually makes you better. Um, or, and then I've also known some writers who, you know, with their very first novel, um, they have a hit. And it, it's very rarely that it's the first draft of a first novel. Usually it's something that they work on and work on and work on for years. And it just happens to be the first thing that they did. And they just refuse to let that idea go. And they just keep working on it, working on it. Some people, like Bradbury said, will write 52 in a year. And knowing full well that probably 51 of those will never see the the light of day. Um, where do you fall in that spectrum? Do you... Uh, do you feel like that that ideas can be golden and when, when you, you know, happen on to one that you should work on it, and work on it until it's ready? Or, uh, you know, is the idea just, uh, you know, are they disposable and you just need to work on your chops until you get to where you need to be? That's a great question. And I think in a way it relates back to this question about the difference between short stories and novels. Because I think I agree with Ray Bradbury that if you're going to write short stories, you might try to write one a week and expect that 51 will be bad and one might be good because there's that magical sort of luck element to it. But I think novels often come from deep obsessions. They come from hauntings. They come from the thing that won't let you go. And so I think if you are deeply interested or even obsessed enough with your novel idea, you should and probably will have the stamina and energy to pursue it for however many years it takes to find its proper form. When, when you're writing a novel, um, what comes to you first? Is it a character? Is it a setting? Is it, um, maybe uh, some topic that you saw on the news that intrigues you. And then, then you start looking for characters to, to put in a situation like that. Uh, what's that first kernel of a story? And, and do you feel like that novels begin differently than short stories do? This is actually a great question because by the novel that I just published, everyone knows how much I love you began as a short story in a funny kind of way that none of the short story is actually in the novel, but a character's, a character's voice and sensibility came to me. I was walking home from the park and I just heard Rose's voice and I went home and wrote a short story and it took me less than a week and found a home relatively easily and then was published in Best American Short Stories. It was like one of those gift experiences that you're always waiting for as an artist and writer. Like it feels like the gods just kind of gave it to me. And after I had finished that short story, I felt like, oh, I'm not done with this voice. I like how sort of funny and a little angry and um, observant she is. And I want to stay with her. And so... I just began to work on expanding her world and that turned into the novel. That's, so, am that's amazing. So it, yeah. it actually literally began with this character. I think that's right. And almost her character, but to be even more precise, I think her voice and her sensibility, there was, I think at the time I had been really trying to write sort of perfect sentences and, a sort of third person omniscient point of view and it was becoming very stiff and sort of perfectionistic. And there was something about discovering the freedom in her voice that was like, Oh yeah, I want to follow this. This energy feels good to me. Now, now speaking of that, but because you brought it up, the, the idea of first versus third person narration, um, do you feel like that there are certain situations that are, are better for one or, one or the other? Uh, and do you feel like that first person can be more personal, uh, for lack of a better term? Uh, and, and can it 
you know, can it also be kind of claustrophobic? Um, could, could you talk a little bit about kind of playing with voice and and where the story comes from for the reader? Where it comes from for the reader. Um, you know, I had a teacher who insisted that there was absolutely no difference between first and third, and anything that you could do in first person, you could do in third person, and vice versa. And I think he liked to say this because then we would argue with him and it would force us to try to articulate <laughs> what we felt the difference was. Sure. <laughs> um, and some part of me likes to say that I think he's right, that I think third person can be as intimate as first and that um, there's sort of the analogy that almost seems right to me is like the difference between driving an automatic and a stick shift car. Like most of us feel more comfortable driving an automatic, just the way first person feels more comfortable for most of us. We're used to speaking in first person just in our daily lives. But if you can master the third person, uh, you become one of those people who really loves sort of um, shifting gears and find listening to the motor of the narrative a little bit more and finding which gear is appropriate. So that may be a little bit too uh, metaphoric and abstract, but I like to think there's sort of more power in third, but I also think I'm still learning how to use it. Do you... Um... As you you took the character of Rose, or, or more specifically the voice of Rose, and and started kind of living with that and expanding it, and 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 really you know asking the questions, uh, you know what would Rose do, and and how would this affect her, or how would she do this? When did the story start, kind of emerging around this voice that you were playing with? I wrote two, maybe two or three drafts very, very quickly and produced hundreds and hundreds of pages. And I think that process was about me sort of trying to seek out the story and the arc. I knew that Rose would be obsessed or deeply interested in her close friend. And I knew that she would sort of try to reach her close friend via the friend's boyfriend. But finding the exact arc took some time. And I think it was actually because I was willing to write quickly and throw away, like our friend Bradbury, that I was able to move towards the arc that felt right within about a year, 18 months, which maybe sounds kind of slow, but I think it's actually pretty fast for novel writing, at least in my own experience. So um, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the story that, that kind of rose up around the character of Rose. Mm -hmm. um, everyone knows how much I love you is, um, uh, you know, very much feels like a, a thriller, uh, a psychological suspense novel. Um, did you have any idea what the genre would be like as you started writing her and her story? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had any idea for a few years. And then I showed it to my writing group. And I'll never forget someone saying, oh, I think you've written an erotic thriller. And I just laughed. But I thought, well, that's great. Maybe people will read it if it's a thriller. Um, but it certainly wasn't my intent. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world setting safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose... You can showcase your amazing world building to the world beautifully and interactively to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind the scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom built world building templates complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. 
Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki-style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 800,000 world builders, including professional authors. Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too. When 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 they said you you've written an erotic thriller, um, did that take you kind of by surprise? Uh, or you know, had you been so involved in the story, you didn't recognize certain aspects of it, um, or kind of what awakened you to what other people thought of the story? It did take me by surprise. I had worked on the book in private for a few years and. Again, the experience of reading that I really love is that feeling of being lost in a book. And so I was really focused on enjoyment and pleasure. And part of what I found pleasurable about Rose was that she's a character who really wants things and goes after things. Um, she has career ambitions. She has sexual desires. She pursues them. But I certainly wasn't thinking that it would be uh sexy or a thriller in any sort of traditional or conventional sense. I think when you get your MFA, you're sort of always told that literary fiction is kind of boring or that sometimes people sort of relate to it like medicine or something. <laughs> and so I was, I was excited when my writing group had this reaction to it. Um, but I wasn't sure if anyone else would share that reaction. And then when we, when my agent and I went out with the book and editors started to get back to us, I realized, oh, wow, people really do see this as a kind of thriller. And it was exciting to me and also a little funny because it's not, it's not something I set out to do. What do you think about those genre designations, you know, as someone who was kind of writing literary and, and, and thinking in those terms, um, but very aware of what people's perceptions are of genre designations. Um, how did you feel about that? I mean, I want the book to reach as many readers as possible. And so if a certain genre designation helps the book reach more readers, I think that's really wonderful. I do think in general, genre designations can be a little silly. I mean, if you think about Patricia Highsmith, who wrote the Talented Mr. Ripley and all the other Tom Ripley books. I mean, they're, they're classics. I think they can stand up against any other book written in the 20th century. Um, I think many people also think of them as thrillers. So we have these sort of high-low designations that we associate with these categories, but it, the world is much, I don't know, it's much more complicated and sort of delightfully murky than that. Tell me um, about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, about the other characters in the book. Um, what happens with Rose, and uh, when does Lacey come into the story? Lacey comes into the story almost immediately. Lacey is Rose's childhood best friend, and after an accident in high school, they don't speak for 12 years. And, to, and then they run, well, I should say, they don't exactly run into each other. They, um, Lacey begins dating someone that Rose knows by coincidence. So a sort of coincidence pulls them back together. And I think the first half of the book is really about Rose reentering a pattern of an old friendship and finding herself repeating some of the 
patterns and also mistakes of her friendship that she had when she was an adolescent. So we see the setup for, um, you know, childhood or maybe not childhood, adolescent um, mistakes, misgivings um, that that wound up in a fractured relationship. Then then we see characters that are mature. Um, these people come back together. Um, you know, was this a an adolescent indiscretion? Uh, is, is this something that we've grown over? Um, a lot of these ideas come up and start working themselves out in the story. And I think it causes us to look at a lot of relationships that we've had and been involved in. And, you know, did, did we, as people grow apart as people do when they get older? Um, there, there's a lot going on in the story. Um, what were some of the, the, the thoughts that you were going through as you wrote this? I think one of the things that I was most interested in is the way in which, as you sort of alluded to, adolescence is such a deeply formative time. And many of us sort of have a low estimation of ourselves during adolescence. Like we, we think we're not very cool. We think we're not part of the cool group. And I think many of us feel haunted by that sense of exclusion, even as we move into our 20s and 30s. It's like this little ghost self from seventh grade follows you around. And I was interested in the way that that can be destructive, not self-destructive, but actually outwardly destructive. So when you have an underestimation of yourself, when you sort of think that you're not that special or not that important, not that cool, because you're still trapped in a sort of middle school or high school mindset, you can actually end up causing a lot of harm and destruction to the people around you simply because you think your actions don't really matter. And I think that's the paradox of Rose, that she doesn't see how powerful she is. And that was kind of the paradox I was interested in exploring in the book. You, um, you mentioned a minute ago um, the... Um, excuse me one second. I have to clear my throat. I apologize. Go for it. A minute ago, you, you mentioned the, the idea of, uh, you know, that, that the, the story kind of turns in the middle. Um, did you know this turn was coming and, and how do you, uh, how do you feel about planning versus uh, pantsing in, in writing? Mm. I did know it was coming. And I actually initially had it almost at the very beginning of the book and then discovered that I needed to sort of write up to it a little bit more. So it, it drifted more towards the middle of the book, this event. Um, I guess my feeling is, it's funny, I'm a, I don't know if I believe in astrology, but I'm a Libra. Libra is the sign of scales. And I find with many of these questions, I sort of like the balance or the middle path between them. So I think it's nice to have a general arc or idea of where you're going when you're novel writing. But I also think that too much planning or too many outlines can uh, hem you in and take away the discovery. So do, do you kind of like the um, the feeling uh, as you're writing that it it's a little bit of uh, of a mystery to you and and you're writing to find out what happens next and um do, do you kind of get that unsettled feeling as you're writing discovering the story like there's infinite possibility I do like that feeling and I think it's less infinite possibility and more a sense of possibility slowly narrowing um, I like that idea. As you, as you kind of make more discoveries and more decisions, the shape begins to emerge and other possibilities fall away. I like that. Um, the new book is called Everyone Knows How Much I Love You. Um, Kyle, what do you think will surprise readers the most? I'm, I'm obviously not asking you to give away the twist and surprise, but what do you think people will come away from this book um, 
feeling that they didn't expect that from this book? I hope they find it funny in places. And I hope they find themselves sort of uh, delightfully shocked at what Rose does. For me, as I was writing it, I kept being like, oh, Rose is more evil than I thought she was. And there was something kind of fun about that. So I would wish my readers the same kind of pleasurable discovery. Absolutely. And I think they'll definitely find that in this book. The book Everyone Knows How Much I Love You just came out uh, a couple of days ago. And uh, we're going to put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, Kyle, this has been so much fun talking about the book. Uh, if if readers are just discovering you and all the great stuff that you do, uh, where can they find you online to connect with all the great stuff you do? I am not a social media person, unfortunately, but I do have a website with a contact form and I will respond to you if you write to me there. So the website is uh, www.kyle.com are like rabbit mccarthy.com excellent we'll put links to that as well uh, so people can easily find you kyle um, i love the book so much and we're recommended to everyone thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today thank you so much for having me and asking such great questions want to grow as a writer and take your writing to the next level give pro writing a to try Pro Writing Aid is a grammar checker, style editor, and writing mentor in one package. Pro Writing Aid will never replace a human editor. Rather, it helps you self-edit to a deeper level so that when you send it off to an editor, they will be able to focus on the meat of your writing and not spend their time fixing basic writing issues. Pro Writing Aid is the only platform that offers world-class grammar and style checking combined with more in-depth reports to help you strengthen your writing. Our unique combination of suggestions, articles, videos, and quizzes makes writing fun and interactive. Writing can be grammatically perfect but still feel awkward and clumsy. Pro Writing Aid searches out elements like repetitiveness, vague wording, sentence length variation, over dependence on adverbs, passive voice, over complicated sentence structures, and so much more. Nothing makes a writer lose credibility faster than spelling and grammar mistakes. Submit clean, error-free writing. Go to ProWritingAid.com and use code HANK20 for 20% off of ProWritingAid Premium. ProWritingAid. Check it out today.